Hey, what's up, you guys? I'm Andrea. And I'm Haley. And you're listening to Inhuman, a true crime podcast. Okay, so before we get started today, um, Haley and I both have a couple of kind of quick updates. Um, The first one is that we had, I guess, gotten a question from a listener about Kendrick Johnson's case. And I have been periodically checking in just to see if there's any updates. And unfortunately, at this time, there is not. Um, If you guys remember during his episode... Um, there was, they had recently reopened the case as of March of 2021, and they said they would hope to be able to get a conclusion within six months, and it's been, what, seven, eight months now? Based on what I've, like, researched, the investigators who are on the case right now, um, were quoted as saying the parents of Kendrick Johnson are not going to like the ending of the resolution, I guess, of the case. And Kendrick Johnson, Kendrick Johnson's parents um, want new eyes on the case. They want new investigators and they actually want to go above um, the local police department and they want to get like the, um, what was it? Uh, it wasn't the FBI. It was like the Supreme Court Justice or something. Oh, okay. Involved to do the investigation. Um, that may not be 100% correct. I can't remember exactly who it was that they want. Like, they were calling to action. Um, but it was okay. higher than the local police there. Right. In, in Valdosta. So, that's kind of that's kind of the, the only update there is right now in the case. So... My assumption is that they are still going to rule this as an accidental death. Right. And his parents wholeheartedly do not believe that that is what caused his death. So I really hope that they get the justice that they're looking for. And I hope that, that someone else can step in and get a fresh set of eyes on you know, what, what went on with, with their son. But as of right now... Yeah. That's what I have for you guys. I will continue to check and update you if anything major happens. But as of now, that's all I have. Yeah, thanks for updating on that. You know, it, it sure. sucks that we don't have uh, any any more updates. But hopefully, like you said, they'll get the justice that they deserve. Absolutely. And then the other little announcement that we wanted to make and. This one is very happy and yes. <laughs> good news. So if you guys have, if you don't follow us on Instagram, I think we've shared a little bit about it on our podcast Instagram, but both Andrea and mm-hmm. I have shared it on our personal Instagrams as well. And I've been sharing it a ton on my personal TikTok account. But there was a four-year-old girl named Cleo Smith who went missing from uh, Western Australia. She was camping with her family and was abducted. This was two weeks ago, and today, the day we're recording this, which in America, it's currently Tuesday, November 2nd, but the day that she was found in Australia was the very early morning of Wednesday, November 3rd, but this morning, Wednesday morning, whatever, at like 1 a.m., police busted into a locked house, and they found Cleo alive and well physically at least yeah so they found her they rescued her she's back with her family um that's pretty much all we know right now because like i said it's really early in australia when we're recording this so hopefully by the episode we record for next thursday so a week from when you guys are hearing this we'll be able to do a more in-depth little update on it yeah but it's just incredible like yeah this type of outcome is so rare. It really is. And I can't wait to hear, like, the details of what happened and how, like, how she is still alive. And how yeah. this man was, you know, involved in whatever happened. Um, yeah, and we don't even know how they found to go to this house or yeah. whatever. But they said they do have a man in custody and they're questioning him. So somebody's That's in good. custody. But we don't, other than that, we, as of... Right now, when we are recording this, we have no updates. Minimal details, yeah. Yeah. If you guys want to get more 
you know, timely updates instead of waiting for the next episode for us to update, you can follow us on our podcast Instagram because I usually will share things on there if they're big updates. And then you can also follow both Andrea and I on our personal Instagrams because we're more active on those. And I share a ton of these types of cases on mine. So I'll definitely be sharing on there. Right. And it's actually really weird because so we're actually recording two episodes today. We're recording the episode for Thursday of this week, but then we're also recording the episode for Monday of next week. And because I'm going to be out of town this weekend and I was doing my notes this morning and at the top of the notes, I wrote down Cleo Smith. I was like, I want to do because we haven't talked about her yet on the podcast. Yeah. Yeah. So I literally wrote down Cleo Smith in like that I wanted to just share her story. Right. And that was like a couple hours before they announced she was found. Wow. That's crazy. Isn't that weird? That is like, weird. <laughs> like you're like manifesting an update and then. Yeah. Ta-da. She was found. Yeah. I'm so happy. I'm really happy for her family because this is not, like you said, this is a very rare outcome yeah. in these situations, unfortunately, especially with children, it seems like. Yeah, it kind of reminds me of um, Amanda Berry and Michelle Knight and Gina De Jesus, who were like yeah. kidnapped and then held captive for ten years. Like nobody expected them to be found alive, and I think the same thing was happening with Cleo. You know, people were some of my Australian followers on Instagram were saying like, you know, they were trying to stay positive, but hope was definitely starting Minimal. to be lost. Yeah. So, yeah, that makes but sense. But they found her. She's yeah. home. I'm sure she's going to need a lot of therapy, therapy and all of that. But thank God she's home with her family. Well, that's good. We don't have we don't usually have a lot of good news on this show. But yeah, another <laughs> another little tidbit I guess I could throw in there is um, I heard that uh, which we haven't ever covered this this case. But if you know Ed Gian, the yeah. serial killer, did you hear that? Like they I, identified I identified one of his victims after like. Pfft, what I don't even know math 20 50 years something like that yeah, I think it's like in the 70s um 60s or 70s I can't remember it's probably earlier than that honestly but that's kind of cool so yeah there's another little yeah. bit of happy happy uh, news <laughs> yeah but now that we brought you up let's bring you back down <laughs> <laughs> um so today I'm gonna be covering the unsolved murder of julie ferguson don't know this one i did not know this one either and i was looking for a very niched down um genre i guess of a case and this one popped up even though it had nothing to do with what i was googling (laughs) so i was i found this case when i was looking for other cases um couldn't find really what I was looking for, but I found this. And once I started reading about it, I was like, how have I not heard about this? Like, Oh, wow. Okay. I don't know. It's, there wasn't like a ton, a ton of information on it. Cause every, every source was like pretty much the same exact, like copy and paste kind of, right. um, you know, research or whatever. But I wanted to cover this cause I haven't heard it and it's unsolved and they, you know, obviously they don't have, a killer in custody and it's been many many years so I feel like it's one that needs to get talked about and pushed out and needs more hoopla right. around it you know yeah okay so in 1995 Julie Lynn Ferguson was 17 years old she was a junior at Eleanor Roosevelt High School in Greenbelt Maryland Julie was looking forward to the next stage of her life starting college and becoming a journalist which was her dream job um, there was reports where that said that she like switched jobs, like she switched, like switched what she wanted to do, like she changed her underwear. But this was like the most current one and the one that she was like the most passionate about at that time. Right. She was known by family and friends as being fun loving and vibrant. Everyone who knew her, or everyone knew her as the girl who walked to school with plastic bags tied around her feet. To keep her Reebok classics (laughs) perfectly white, which that is hilarious to me because I can just see that, especially like in that time, you know, like the mid 90s, like Reebok classics were like very, which they're like on trend right now too, I guess. But that's just so funny. I I just, I visualized that. So that made me laugh. 
All her friends thought Julie was so cool because she had her own phone line (laughs) in the days before everyone had cell phones. I love that. Which that's how it was when I was in school too because like some people had cell phones but mostly like no one did. So if you had your own phone line like you were you were cool. Yeah. On the evening of March 20th 1995 Julie had ended her shift as a cashier at Linens and Things, which was a store at a local strip mall. She had called her mom to confirm that her friends were going to pick her up that night um, because they had plans to attend the funeral of another friend's mother the following day. She said goodnight to her co-workers and then wandered over to the liquor store that was next door to buy a soda, and she sat and waited on a flower box close to the street for her ride. There was several eyewitnesses who said they saw Julie. They waved to her as they ducked into the liquor store. Julie's mom had recently bought her an older car so she could get to and from work, but it couldn't pass inspection, so Julie had to rely on her mom and friends for rides until the repairs could be made. There was, um, like, her school and her job was in walking distance, but her mom didn't really want her walking because, like, you right. know, yeah. it's not, like, the, always the safest thing. Like, even in that time. Yeah. And it was just Julie and her mom because her father had actually passed away when she was a year old. Aww. So, on that evening, Julie's friends were actually a little bit late, you know, picking her up. And they arrived shortly before 10 p.m. When they got there, they noticed Julie wasn't where she said she was going to be waiting, which her friends thought was unusual. However, on that curb where she said she was going to be waiting, her friends found a bag with her work clothes and the soda can that Julie had been drinking, which was still wet with condensation. So they knew that she must have been there at one point or another. Right. Her panicked friends immediately notified her mother, Pam Ferguson, and when they realized that Julie wasn't there, they then contacted the police. Julie was reported missing pretty quickly, and the search for her began almost immediately, which is good because, you know, she's 17, which is technically still a child, and it's the 90s, so I feel like by the 90s, they kind of had their shit together when it came to, like, missing children and stuff. Yeah. But, you know, even to this day, we still have issues with that. Yeah. Unfortunately, the search ended about seven and a half hours later on on March 21st when two men on their way to work noticed a lifeless body on the 12,100th block of Daisy Lane in Glendale, which was a growing community of townhouses and subdivisions about four miles from the strip mall where Julie worked. I'll just give a trigger warning for this next part. Um, Julie was found fully clothed. While there was no indication of robbery or sexual assault, she had been brutally murdered. The cause of death was confirmed as strangulation, but she had also had her throat slit, presumably to make sure that she was dead. But that also kind of wow. seems like a crime of passion, you know? Yeah. She also was covered in bruises, and her arms and legs had multiple defensive wounds. There was no doubt about it. Julie had fought hard for her life. Oh, no. Which is like, yeah, it's so sad. Julie was generally liked by many different groups of people and had no known enemies. Those who knew Julie knew she would not willingly get into a car with someone she didn't know. She wouldn't have continued to wait outside alone if she felt she wasn't safe. Greenbelt was known for its police presence, and it wouldn't have been unusual to see a patrol car standing or parked somewhere in or near Mm. the strip mall. And there was also reports that people had been rollerblading in the parking lot. And then, of course, friends and acquaintances of Julie's had seen her and spoke to her up, up to the moments before she vanished. Right. So there was a lot of activity going on out there. So it was really bizarre that, you know, she just disappeared. Yeah. It was like she was there and then she was just gone. Her friends were distraught and terrified that there was a killer or killers on the loose. And the entire community of Greenbelt was on edge. And it was quoted that their community was never the same. 
Oh, that's so sad. Especially small communities like that. Like, yeah. Oh. Investigators immediately began questioning witnesses who were present at the strip mall around the time of Julie's disappearance. They had seen, allegedly they had seen a red or burgundy colored car with two black men and a black woman inside and had seen Julie leaning into the car window talking to them sh- like shortly before she disappeared. Okay. But that car and the people inside it were never located. No one could ever wow. identify okay. the three people in the car. But nonetheless, police did believe that Julie was most likely taken by somebody against her will. Just based on, right. like, the kind of person that she was and all the things that people said about her. Gerald Borman, the high school's principal, told students what happened to Julie over the school's PA system. Shortly after school began that morning, he said that school administrators had opened up a counseling center for students and that at any one time, as many as 50 students were there seeking comfort and wanting answers. And at least 10 grieving students who took Julie's death particularly hard were sent home. I think that's amazing that they did that because, yeah. I mean, when I was in school, like we had... We didn't have someone get murdered, but we had someone that passed away from a car accident. Like, they didn't do that. (laughs) So I feel like that's good for them, you know? That is really impressive, honestly, because I feel like there might be, like, counselors or something. I don't know. Like, we had a teacher pass away, and they had, like, or they didn't even have counselors, but they were like, somebody's available if you need to talk. But that was it. You know, like, they, it wasn't, like, this whole thing that it sounds like they're doing. Yeah. That's amazing. Good for them. I know. Especially for, like, that time, too. I feel like now yeah. it might be more common. I don't know. Right. Students also organized a candlelight vigil to be held on the school's football field. Since Julie loved flowers, students planted a dogwood tree in front of the school in remembrance of her. Oh. I know. Um, posters bearing the teenager's name and asking for help identifying her killer were hung by students at the shopping center where she was last seen. Like, these these kids really went in. <laughs> like, they yeah, really cared really. about wow. Julie and getting, you know, her killer found. Yeah. As I mentioned before, witnesses claim to have seen three people talking to Julie in that red or burgundy vehicle before she disappeared. But there are also some other suspects in her disappearance as well. Police questioned a spurned admirer. They didn't name him, so I don't I don't know who he was, but he was considered a suspect due to the fact that he had made a number of passes at Julie and was rejected, and he did not take that very well, according to homicide detective Nelson. Okay. That suspect, though, was later convicted of a separate homicide. Oh. And is now, thankfully, behind bars. Okay. But at the time, they had absolutely no evidence on him. And after speaking to him several times, they couldn't prove that he was involved. But he seems like a pretty good candidate. Right. I mean, you go on and kill somebody after somebody was killed that you're tied to. Like, that's... Yeah, that's definitely kind of damning, but very circumstantial. It is, it is. And they had no, there was, you know, no DNA evidence, I guess, on her, which is crazy. That's always so crazy to me. I'm like, how can people just like have no DNA, especially because she like fought, you know? Yeah. Well, I mean, that, you know, unfortunately, circumstantial evidence like that can only go so far. And I mean, that's what this won't happen because Brian Laundry is not alive but yeah. if he were alive who knows if they would have been able to actually prove that he did it beyond a reasonable doubt or whatever it needs to be that he did it even though everybody thinks that he did you know like right. so oh, that sucks yeah but I'm glad he's at least behind bars now yeah so if he is you know he's getting his you know payment for what he did but right in those situations i feel like it's so unfair to the families though because like they never they don't know so they don't get the justice so yeah the next the next suspect was doug de silva um de silva was in jail for raping a woman close to where julie was found 
DNA evidence cleared him from Julie's case, but investigators still felt that he was somehow involved. Okay. He did not have a solid alibi of where he was at the time that she went missing and was found murdered. That always, like, whenever somebody says they don't have a solid alibi, that's what always gets me. Because it's like, if you just don't have an alibi that, like, you were home alone or something. Yeah. That's one thing. But, and maybe that's what they meant here. But in general, when, you know, it's like an alibi changes a ton or something. I'm like, that makes you seem suspicious. More suspicious than just, I was home alone. Yeah. And even if you're home alone, I feel like, like, unless you live in the middle of nowhere and have no neighbors, like, somebody might be able to account for you being where you say you are, you know? Right. And even saying, like, oh, you're, I saw their car in the driveway. Yeah. Because yeah. I'm very aware, like, when my neighbors are not home, like, I know they're not home. Right. I see their cars not in the driveway. Like. Right, like, yeah, you definitely are aware, hopefully, yeah. of what's going on in your neighborhood. Yeah. Some people aren't. Some people are completely unaware of their surroundings, like. I mean, yeah, true. Yeah. We're, we're like, total crime junkies, so we're, we pay attention to everything, so yes. maybe we're a little biased. Yes. I've been like this since I was a kid, though. I, like, notice people and, like, things and just... Yeah. Over the top. Maybe that's like my anxiety or something. I kind of did too until I got on anxiety medication. <laughs> that's what I said. It's and probably my anxiety. <laughs> yeah. Now I'm like, I am very like, I don't care about anything. <laughs> which like sometimes is not, I get to the point where I'm like, it's not good. Like I need to, yeah. Yeah. Like the fact that I didn't take my bridesmaid's dress in to get altered until the week of the wedding that I'm going to be like, in. Eh. Yeah, like, I'm just like, eh, like, it's fine. And so definitely there's times where the anxiety meds are not good. Yeah. But I know what you're saying. Yeah. (laughs) Um, He also provided some statements that would indicate that he could possibly be involved. I don't know what these statements are. They've never released them. But it never amounted to anything and could never push police over the edge to actually charge him. So... Again, circumstantial. Maybe he was, like, playing with police. Because you know how dickheads do that sometimes. They're like, huh, I did oh, it. Yeah. No, I didn't. Yes, I did. Yeah. So maybe it was one of those situations. But this is interesting. Since being released from his rape charge, De Silva has not been seen or heard from by his family. Not even his daughter. Oh. Yeah. So he went M-I-A. So again, that could be pretty damning evidence if you look at it a certain way. Yeah. So about five years after Julie's death, a new new lead... Is that the word? I'm so tired. (laughs) A new lead arose. (laughs) Police identified a person of interest in the case... It was a white man believed to have been preying on young girls near the University of Maryland. But much like the three people in the red car, this lead led to nowhere, sadly. And they could not find this man. Damn. Yeah. Everything kept, like, slipping through their fingers, it seems like. Right. It was just, like, not enough girth to, like, hold anybody. I don't know why I said girth. I hate myself. <laughs> God. Okay. <sighs> Julie's case remains unsolved to this day, like I mentioned at the top of the episode. But police and investigators hold out hope that advances in DNA technology might lead them to the killer, which now is the time. What are they doing? They need to, like, get in there, (laughs) scrape under the fingernails, you know, that kind of stuff. Which I'm sure they took a lot of DNA evidence, you know, like when they found her body. They had to have. They, yeah, especially in the 90s. Yeah. There is a Facebook page ran by Friends of Julie. It's called Justice for Julie Ferguson. And they post regular updates regarding the case there. After Julie's death, the lot where her body was located was turned into a park. And it was named in honor of her. Aww. I know. Like, this town really cares about their people. It's, it's almost unheard of. Yeah. Julie's mother, Pam, told the Washington Post that she never thought it would take this long to close her daughter's case. 
She hopes that anyone with the tiniest piece of information about her daughter will come forward. She said, quote, It's very frightening to think I could die and not know who did it. That is what frightens me the most. Mm. Could you? I can't imagine, like, losing your husband and losing your child. Like, yeah. And having no, like, closure no for answers. that. No answers, yeah. Yeah. A reward of up to $25,000 is available for information information leading to an indictment or arrest in the case. Anyone with information can call Prince George's County Police at 301-772-4925 or you can remain anonymous and call 1-866-411-TIPS. I will add both of those numbers to the show notes down below. There are so many people, I mean, just reading her, um, the Facebook page that was made in her honor, there are so many people out there who still care about Julie and her case, people who are still looking for answers and won't give up until Julie and her family have the justice that they deserve. So I made sure to like, um, like that page so I can keep up with it and remember that it's there. Maybe, maybe you can share it share the page into our facebook group for the podcast yeah that's a good idea that way i definitely everybody can do that. go like because i definitely want to follow it too yeah i feel like that like crime junkie says it's a season of justice and we're still in that season of justice and i feel like this is a, a definitely solvable case for sure yeah so i really hope that they um dig into it again soon sooner than later and they get some answers and can finally figure out who did this horrible thing to this young girl. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's my episode for this week. Um, Julie Ferguson. If you're, especially if you're like, you know, in the Maryland area, um, share this case. I will, of course, be posting pictures and information on our Instagram at inhuman underscore podcast. Um. Again, I will have everything, all the references and any information listed in the show notes. And I guess that's it. Yeah, that was that was really good. I hope that, yeah, anybody in the area can share about it and just keep talking about it because that's what puts pressure on police to keep working to, to find the answers. Absolutely. So thank you guys so much again for listening today. We appreciate all your support. And until next time, keep it human. Bye.